Okay, brilliant to be here. We have a fantastic panel lined up. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves properly in a minute, but we have um, Pavel Orzakowski uh, joining us live. Is that, is that, have I butchered your name there? Brilliant, fantastic. Andrew Harding and Tiago Viana. So, first to introduce themselves, let's go to Andrew, please. All right. Um, I am the, and I'm Andrew Harding. I'm the Open Tech Lead in Transformation Directorate, the body formerly known high as NHSX. Um, and in theory, that's a strategy and governance role in the main. So I'm kind of tinkering behind the scenes, trying to make a better environment for sharing open code in general. Basically, my mandate is let's try hard not to buy the same thing twice if you avoid that. Um, luckily, though, I also happen to be an analyst. Specifically, I'm a physicist. But the problem is, when you train as a physicist, they lie to you um, pretty brutally. Firstly, they tell you that Fortran is the best language on Earth, which clearly it isn't. Uh, and secondly, they tell you that you're going to be doing physics when actually you're going to be doing statistics most of the time. Um, I'm a thermodynamicist. I'm going into climatology. That's what my doctorate's in. Um, but you wind up, again, lied to, because most of the good work in climatology is actually in policy, not so much in the science. There's enough much better scientists than I am, but not very many people who can do both science and policy. Uh, and that's why I wound up in government support. Um, I've been through the Canadian government, the Scottish government, uh, the UK government, uh, regulation. Uh, my last week was the little thing called the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which you might know about from their algorithmic bias report. Um, and over the course of the last couple of years, I've been then trying to formulate uh, an open source policy for the NHS. Um, and a couple of other things that undoubtedly we'll talk about over the course of this panel. Thank you, Andrew. And um, Tiago, to you next, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiago Vienna. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Gloucestershire, and probably an intruder here, because most people are from um, health or, or NHS or, or areas related, but hopefully a good intruder. Um, uh, my background is in soft engineering, computer science, um, um, soft engineering and programming, uh, security, privacy and security, and uh, quite recently um, in health technologies, um, especially in network security for healthcare. I have a couple of papers and research projects in the area uh, in terms of using zero trust in the healthcare, which is quite challenging but super, super interesting, um, as well as um, data uh, and machine learning, data analytics for image recognition, for cancer as well. We recently published a paper on using AI for early stage cancer uh, detection as well. Um, at the University of Gloucestershire, we have recently uh, started a master's in health technologies, which one of my colleagues, uh, Mark Bailey, is here as well and is part of the program where we are working with the local NHS in, in Gloucestershire to build projects. So this is a 100% project-based course, so no lessons. It's here's a problem, what do you need to learn to to solve this problem, let's solve this problem. And then we use Python, we use R, we use so many other technologies that we would think that is interesting and relevant uh, for the area. Um, um, also the courses for our digital forensics course. I have some forensics background as well. Been working, um, I'm from Brazil, so I'm really looking forward for the World Cup, um, where hopefully we're gonna get um, this one. But there you go, um, been working um, for 15 years or so in industry and academia um, in Brazil uh, uh, as well and in the UK uh, with different organizations, uh, industry and academic, academia, have been lied to many times as well as realized you know, how many things are different from academia, industry and quite recently the NHS. So we're finding you know, how things are, are working differently. But here we are, happy to, to be here in this panel and we're looking forward to interacting with you all. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, to Pavel, please. Great, let's check if you can hear me first. Can you hear me right? We absolutely can, yes. Oh, awesome. Thanks for having me, sir. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, apologies, I cannot be there in person. Um, so, my name is Pavel Wojciechowski. Uh, the name is long in Polish and means walnuts, uh, but it's yet unpronounceable if you uh, didn't have luck of being born in Poland. Uh, I'm a lecturer of programming in business school of Edinburgh University, but also recently I've been lecturing in the med school here and in literature and in politics, and I'm lecturing Python. So, basically, what I'm doing is I teach Python to people who this is not their main craft. 
they're not like doctors, they're business people or doctors, nurses or um, uh, health uh, uh, professionals that need it as a tool. Um, and what I've been doing over the last few years, I've open sourced, so basically released for free, all of my notes, all of my videos, and all of the code, which is also available to you, and that's partially what, why I'm here. Um, it seems like that my, my, my superpower, my gift, is that I'm quite good at getting people into coding, at getting people, so that maybe first steps and start thinking about it as, as, as storytelling exercise. Because, um, you know, coding is literally telling a story to someone. All of my notes are on codestorytelling.com, so it's in the name. Um, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later. I'm also the head of technical team in Feeling Good App, uh, which is something that Scottish NHS uses, like the well-being uh, audio program. But it's, it's um, I'm basically working every day with people in health uh, uh, and in programming. And sort of, it, that's, that's where I find my joy, and hopefully I'll be able to share uh, some of that joy with you all. But thank you for having me here. Yeah. Thank you. Sharing joy is definitely something to aim to do. Uh, okay, so we have a few pre-prepared questions before we move to the audience for any questions you have to the panel. Um, and the first question is to Andrew. Um, and it is very simply, why now? So I should provide some context to that question. And just to reiterate that the title of this panel discussion is the impact of upskilling the health sector in open source. So why now? Why use Python or open source software in health and care? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surprisingly complicated question answer for such a simple question. But the, so the tech hasn't really changed that much in the last five, maybe 10 years. But the way it's organized really has. So first of all, we've got all of these interesting initiatives around security research environments, trusted research environments you mentioned earlier, which gives us a place to kind of build communal code around, which is super interesting and super useful and a lovely place to get involved. Um, related also to the tech, we've just got uh, VS Code and Git on uh, the NHS England kind of provision. So for the first time, you can actually get straight into it via the medium of NHS England resources, which is lovely. Um, but that's not really the good answer. The good answer is the community is in a better spot than it's been pretty much ever, which is thanks to folks in this room and folks in the next room. Um, that's unparalleled and, and really unique. The amount of innovation that's coming out of our community is is wild. I mean, we've heard some yesterday, we'll hear more today. Um, that's everything from um, kind of back office enterprise support through to homology, through to everything. Uh, there's large contribution into that from academia. So the code that went into key COVID came out of risk assessments that was university based in the first place. And that's been leaked into an NHSD kind of development process. So that is really nice. Um, there's more private support than there ever has been before. So we're seeing uh, stewardship, we're seeing um, kind of uh, consortium ready private groups who are ready to help support and open ready private companies that are ready to work with us. So Linux Foundation for Public Health, uh, Public Money, Public Code, a handful of other folks are ready to go. Um, and we've got Mandate as well. So you line up all of those things with uh, They Saves Lives, Gold Acre Review, which we heard some about yesterday, some about your talk, um, our response to the Gold Acre Review, which is ongoing and bold and very pleased about. Um, We've got open source policy in draft, which I can talk more about if anyone wants to come talk to me about it. Um, we've got so many examples, which I should plug, sorry, open source playbook being published pretty soon. Um, it, everything is lining up in a way that it just has not done prior to this. Lining up is a nice way to describe it, and the mandate is so important. I can see a few people, well, I can see that Pavel and uh, Tiago are noddling on a little bit there. Is there anything you'd particularly like to add to that? Question. Let's go to Tiago first, then Pavel. Um, no, it's, 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 it's the best moment, isn't it? So it's, there is no moment like now. We cannot do anything about yesterday. We cannot do, I know I'm quoting a movie, but there you go. But, but it's, it's the best answer, isn't it? Um, there's nothing we can do about yesterday but learn. And there's nothing we can do about tomorrow but you know, hope. So we have to do something. I go back to what you, uh, your lovely slide. If you want something to be built, you need to build it yourself. So essentially, best moment now. Indeed, thank you. And Pavel? Uh, it's quite amazing that everything I do right now with teaching and with spreading stuff, 
uh, I couldn't have done five years ago. So now it's just a, it's a golden moment when the tech and the open source community and everything just caught up. And also things are cheaper. So now you can run things like Jupyter Notebooks for free yeah. out there. <clears throat> uh, while this, this used to be prohibitive if you needed you know, a PhD in computer science to do this proper. Uh, and now it's just available to everyone. So um, it's, it's a perfect uh, alignment. Yes, that's a very good point. We haven't really dwelled on much, but actually just the fact that other stuff is now much more readily available is, is so, so important. Okay, let's move on to our next question, which um, is specifically to, um, to Pavel, but again, very interested if others have further thoughts to add at the end. Um, but Pavel, your thoughts on how to start. So um, what could be the first step in getting going with Python in your experience? Nice. Uh, thank, thank you for the question, uh, even though it was prepared. <laughs> uh, so, in my, I get when, when I'm starting my people coding, and I must have sort of made my way through about 1,500 students by now uh, in the last bunch of years, uh, you need the resources uh, and you need the environment to do so. And by environment, I mean coding environment, I mean people around you. So, a community like this one, you know, it not only gives you the reason to do stuff, there are a lot of good examples of people doing stuff well. Uh, in coding, but also it's it's a sort of uh, motivation. So um, I encourage much of my students, but also my, my health colleagues to volunteer uh, in places, but also go to communities uh, which where, where where you can practice being of uh, Both of us be talking about environment, about people you learn with, about your cohort. Even if you're not within the uni or within a particular course, just having some people like you who are going through the same journey. Um, one of my uh, stories that really sort of uh, brings warmth to my heart, which we need now in Scotland, as you can see, it's raining on site. Um, I, I teach an MSc data science for health and social health, and it's purely online, so it fits within the schedule, a busy schedule for people who, uh, who are practicing medicine. And quite often, my students show up in scrubs to the two hour coding session, and I'm thinking, okay, what can I teach them in these two hours that's more meaningful than you know, saving lives that they were doing just out there? So uh, somehow, uh, and yet they can't come, and yet they do it. So for me, one thing to, the first thing to do for you is to, or to friends and family, you know, or colleagues that want to start, is to find the environment, the community, where where you want to sort of do it. And it's going to be under uh, value, you know. Like theoretically, people do go to the gym, but theoretically, you do most of these exercises in your bedroom, but nobody does with them, do they? Um, so that's one big thing: start so having this, this the motivational environment uh, around you. And another one is the resources. So you probably all experienced when you were starting your journey uh, into coding that most coding courses are terrible. They're just like unusable because most coding courses are for people who can already code. And they're written by people who've been coding for 20 mm -hmm. years. So it's just, it's, just, it's wild. Like I, I, I can't understand it. It's just so beyond me. So um, it was quite when you want to start, go for high school Python books. Uh, the, 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 they're just really well written and they're written for people who really need to be constantly motivated and explain things well, but also very sharp and quick, which all of you are. So start with Python books for high school and then basically hop into any Python book, preferably just poking your heads, uh, your eyes into different ones. Libraries have a lot of them, by the way, oh, at, least, at least in Scotland. There are sort of online resources like my uh, code storage link, uh, come where people try to write programming courses, but not in a particular language, so, so these are persons that teach you to think like a coder. And this is this is a, a quite an amazing um, skill, really. Like I strongly believe coding, uh, programming happens on paper. Like programming happens when you make doodles, you know, you just start solving the puzzle on a whiteboard and bridge magnets with your colleagues. The rest is just typing. You know, for typing, you can hire the person to do typing, but programming is, is where you are. So to start that journey. Um, I really need to start uh, simple, like don't be shy about high school notebooks. Uh, also find a community. When I do stuff, everything I do really with all of my students is we're using paradigm for pair programming, where I randomly uh, pair groups of two humans at one computer, and they basically pass the keyboard around every 10 minutes. I have this gigantic clock in my classroom, and they eat every 10 minutes, and you basically pass the keyboard around. So think about it, you finish this. Uh, this answer to the question how to start. Think about it. Every 10 minutes, you're the person typing, and someone standing next to you is sort of asking you questions. And then in 10 minutes, it's them who's typing, and it's your role to be like your navigator. 
their, you know, like angel and the devil in a cartoon sitting on your shoulder. So that's that's kind of a metaphor where you you basically you need someone to talk to, really, because programming is, is a is a community experience. It's it's a storytelling that you do with with, with other humans. Um, the final thing I wanted to say about resources, it's not just about books or videos or courses. It's also about uh, the, sort of the coding snippet that's coding examples, and obviously the internet is full of them. But you need to run them somewhere. So this is something you might have experienced you know, in the very beginning, especially when you're working like most of my students on NHS computers, where you cannot just install Python on your computer because you know uh, at least the ones I work with in Scotland, it's it's all blocked. You cannot just install stuff. So, uh, so finding an environment where you can have an online through the web browser, uh, you do need to be online for that, but uh, you do need to install stuff, and that's the case. The, the journals things. Um, so find other people and talk to them how they started, what, how do they run their code, what are the books or podcasts uh, that they listen to, and hopefully that's going to start you. But be aware that starting with a programming book, you have 80% chance it's going to be unusable. Uh, so just sort of keep in mind that the programming books will be useful to you once you know how to program, but the initial steps uh, are all about joy and community. I'll just answer a little bit. I'm, I'm imagining uh, that other fundamentals are also nodding and had something to chip in. And I wonder how everyone else started in the well, well, exactly. I was just sat here thinking I'm really meant to be hosting this, but can't. I feel like I need to give my 10 pence worth too. They, that, that was really interesting, and I think will probably resonate with a lot of people in the room about actually you pick up a textbook and it's just impenetrable. Um, the idea that you can just start small, and for me, it was actually just trying to reuse the code that someone had put on a blog post for my own purposes and actually reuse someone else's code rather than start from scratch is definitely a, a way forward. You mentioned, of course, that a lot of people, and again, this will resonate in the room, will have struggle, struggle getting Python actually installed onto their laptop and therefore online is better. Do you have any specific online um, sites or tools that you can recommend? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm quite lucky that I'm within one of five or six unis in UK who have access to this online posting environment called Notable. Um, I think it was originally built in Edinburgh Uni, and now they're sort of renting it out. If you gather a critical mass of people who are within NHS have subscription to it, they could, you probably will be able to get it. So that's Notable. There's a bunch of online platforms that are starting freaky, and inevitably within half an hour, there's half a Within half a year of existence, they introduce paid tiers, and within half a year of existence, they stop being free. So it's often about changing what uh, what sort of platform is currently free. I always updated on my book storytelling blog. So there's always a link to which one is free right now. I think Deep Code or Deep Something uh, is is the one I'm currently recommending to my students. Um, but what's really nice if you manage to uh, gather a bunch of people and, and share either a resource or even a subscription to something, or uh, to, to get your organization to get you it. Uh, I hope that helps a little bit. So basically, I'm trying to always have what we currently currently free one, um, and I'm absolutely not with Notable. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, uh, Tiago, Andrew, anything to add, or any sort of thoughts on your intro to Python? Uh, yeah, no, it's great. I mean, um, this is one of the things I agree uh, a lot with, with you, Paolo, which is um, coding is about solving problems, right? The rest is a language that you're using the same way as you can say the same thing in Portuguese, in French, in Japanese, in whatever. Um, you can say the same thing, so the same idea will be there. You uh, asked, uh, we all brought ideas on what we can do with Python, and everything that you've mentioned we can do in R, we can do in Fortran, we can do in assembly. We can do in C, we can do in C++. Some will be easier, some you're going to want to kill yourself because it's super hard. Some will be <laughs> um, uh, more complex and so on. But you can do anything. Uh, having the idea is what matters. And we are in a room full of incredibly smart people, you know, intelligent people, that will certainly be able to do whatever you want to do in programming. So just don't be afraid. You, you literally can do anything. You can start from wherever it works for you. Um, at the university, we work a lot with project-based approaches, which sometimes is much easier because we have this uh, disciplinar approach which sometimes doesn't work because let's learn just coding, let's learn just database, let's learn just this. And then the problem is, okay, how do I put it all together? And, and ultimately, the word is not disciplinar. The word is multidisciplinar. So sometimes it's much easier to learn 
when you have a project, this is what I want to build. What do I need to build this? The solution is here, is in my head. I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly how this is going to work. I know exactly how this is going to behave. I just need some way to put it into a code. How do I do it? And it's a, it's a nice way of starting as well. And Andrew? I'm, I'm going to disagree just a tiny bit, which is that just like spoken languages, programming languages give you a way to see the world. And Python is a great way to see the world. It's a great way to start with. So my first, my first point is, is like, do start with Python. It's great. The spirit of Python is very much, there must be a way to fix this. And that's lovely. Whereas the spirit of Fortran is, let's even have it until it breaks, which is not so good. Um, that's thing number one. Thing number two, uh, if you do not have any peers to talk to around your coding, although that is obviously the best thing to do, absolutely, not least of all because a lot of documentation is terrible, uh, the rubber decking method is my favorite thing on earth. You can have a little like inanimate object on your desk, and as long as you explain what you're trying to do to that object, you will then understand it. You will be a better coder for it. I have a little Pac-Man ghost on my desk that I explain problems to, you, and then that helps me myself. Um, but the last thing is, please, please don't contribute to the problem. Uh, as you're coding, please make your comments the thing that you're explaining to your Pac-Man ghost or rubber ducky or whatever it was, um, because a lot of the documentation is terrible. And the more we collectively try and fix that, the better it will be. Wonderful. And as we continue the panel, please do also chip in with your own thoughts on how best to get started. I suspect there's an awful lot of uh, uh, insight in the room. But let's move on to our next planned question. Our, I think this is our sort of final planned question, um, and that is to Tiago. How can universities and the healthcare sector work together? That's a very good um, question, and, and you know, there's so many things uh, university and not only the healthcare, but so many other organisations can work together. Uh, we go through research, which is a great way of testing things, of discovering new things. And there are so many projects, so many things that can be built together, uh, KTP projects, projects that will uh, generate solutions, which is great. We have um, great uh, bright minds in the university, in the healthcare, which can work together. Um, a very good, brilliant example is um, the example that Mark's going to give in his talk. So uh, Mark was able to develop such an amazing solution. And this was built, again, with the support of some students. So we had some students who uh, helped Mark, and again, going back to what I said before, all the idea was in Mark's mind, so he had, this, this is exactly what I want to build, but obviously, you know, in terms of the coding and some of the frameworks and stuff like that, that's when uh, some of our students, myself as well, and other people, we were able to help, and then Mark, alongside those students, were able to build this solution uh, and learn and, and, and work together in, in such an amazing solution, and it's going to be a great talk, I'm pretty sure. Uh, about that, so we have placement students, apprenticeships. I think, um, yeah, we had the uh, the lady uh, here, which I think she is doing or was doing an apprenticeship, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Apprenticeships, uh, uh, which are a great opportunity. I mentioned the the masters as well, and going back to what Power mentioned, uh, there are so many levels you can enter. You know, in with uh, regards to short courses, uh, longer courses like a BSc or an MSc. Uh, as I said before, the, the MSc we're proposing is project-based, so you can focus on the project, you can focus on the solution you want to build, and this sometimes motivates a lot of people to get into coding and progress into coding, because one of the biggest challenges that people have with coding is, okay, I know how to do Hello World, how does that help me? This doesn't really help me uh, at all. The other thing, obviously, is the different learning styles. Uh, which is interesting, Andrew talked about Python as being a good entry level uh, for, for your experience. Other people would have you know, different experiences. Python is a good uh, programming language to start because it's very uh, English, English based. And there are so many courses that the university and universities as a whole can help with short courses uh, as well. Research, as I mentioned, uh, and, and projects that can be used in practice one of the things that really make me sad is to see such amazing projects that students do in dissertations, BSc dissertations, MSc dissertations, PhD theses, and great, we had a Viva, you got a piece of paper, thank you very much, this goes into the library, it goes into the online library, so many good stuff you know, that are published out there and are used, um, you know, integrated with the NHS, so in other words, um, 
we can work together in, in so many levels to produce, to build, to test, to work, and just to tick a very important box, resistance is futile. <laughs> Brilliant, sorry, that pleased me a little bit too much. Um, okay, I do wonder <laughs> if anyone else on the panel has anything to add at that point. Um, just that working in NHS, the one thing that we are in short supply of is time. Um, and I think clearly there's lots of folks in the academic sector who are aching for good projects with good application that can then be used. So I think buddying up with your local university and offering them things that you do not have the time or capacity to work on uh, is productive for everybody in between as well. For sure. Pavel. Uh, I really like how, how Han uh, uh, is, is promoting the idea of delegating. But the nice thing about working with the community you have on your guy uh, is often they have infrastructure. For example, places who run your notebooks or some data sets that they have available, or students who just have a lot of time and, and sort of energy on their hands. Uh, to, to, to work on stuff. So I know this as a person from uni who works with healthcare organizations, but also as you know the CTO of that health startup who works with a bunch of unis. It's just a mutually uh, happy uh, um, how to work. So it's it's um, again just spreading a sort of tentacles and seeing seeing who, who is there to work cross pollinate ideas with uh, it is quite nice. Uh, I like something that Mr. Tinker said uh, about um, you know, why Python that sort of reads a little bit like English. Uh, what's what's nice about it, and that's sort of that's why people use it to teach. That's why it's popular with universities. Luckily for you all, uh, also. Um, but it's kind. Like it really tries to help you. It's like a clumsy best friend. Uh, so it's this. Um, there's something that uh, people who are trying to use Python for really useful stuff, like like this community, but also students. Uh, who share a lot of uh, things that we have in common. So it's, it's, it could be about finding things in common. Absolutely. Um, good points, I think, on particularly the fact that all these projects get done that could be used and the data sets as well that are held. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, we have some uh, questions and uh, feedback from our online community. So hello out there, everybody watching online. And the first thing to say is I think... Um, if you could make sure you talk up quite loudly when you're answering the questions, please. And the second is a question from Mohammed about security. So people who typically work in NHS find it very hard to get things on, on their laptops, in particular Python and open source tooling. Have you got any um, comments or thoughts on how best to overcome that? Hey, go on, Andrew. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> this is, this is going to be a perennial problem, I think. Um, but... The way that the NHS is restructuring at the moment, I think, offers a helpful avenue there. Because um, although at the moment kind of, it's very much a question about um, proving the point, I think Johnny said yesterday about proving the point to your local kind of IT support team and making sure that they understand what it's for, and that will help to get the right tools. I, I think when we have more um, kind of place-based region based cohesion around how things are structured, that will help us make those points, those justifications to larger groupings of organizations at the same time. So hopefully we're going to be in an increasingly good spot where we can communicate to the folks who are in charge of various security protocols of this kind um, that this is, you know, that we're doing these, these things for good reasons, uh, that there are huge, there's huge amounts of value to be added for this stuff, you can get increasing buy-in senior management that can then help work plan around. Um, so yeah, I think I think things are improving on that front. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a second part of this question, I think, uh, which is, what do you open and when? And uh, good modern coding practice is definitely to modularize your code. So we can start with the things that are less contentious uh, and move into the things that are more contentious as and when it's appropriate to do so. So obviously you should be keeping your secrets and your keys and all your credentials kind of not published, that would be a, a dramatic error. Um, but a lot of your processing work, a lot of the analytical work, a lot of the algorithmic work, you're going to do that, absolutely, you can open up in dozen 
pose a security threat under most circumstances. I'm thinking about one thing I, that's maybe an exception, which is character forward work. Um, but yeah, I think we're in an okay spot that's getting better, and part of the point of justifying ourselves to folks who are in charge of our security protocols is that this can be progressive. It doesn't have to be all of us. Um, um, that, that's quite a good one, especially uh, because one of my uh, areas of work. Uh, I think one of the benefits of using Python and open source is this, isn't it? Because uh, when you do it open source, it's thoroughly tested, it's thoroughly understood, it's thoroughly, thoroughly analyzed. So if you have a solid open source solution which has been properly tested, this should provide a bit more of confidence to implement it in the NHS. I go back to the university as well as a good um, test bed, as a good environment to test as well and to uh, work with um, solutions and, and make sure they are safer. Uh, I give an example of uh, software that is being produced. People are getting a lot of money because of that, uh, which is a lot of people is afraid of some Python libraries because you don't really exactly know what's happening in the background. And there are some new solutions being built to abstract security for you. So these solutions would be interacting with the libraries and your code to ensure that no security threat happens in this interaction. Because sometimes your code is safe, but maybe the library that you're using is not so safe as you would like to be. And it is possible to have this bridge in between to abstract it. And this is the beauty of Python, isn't it? It is a more abstracted solution, which is. Just very quickly, um, also helping this is uh, we've got a bunch of national level policy and guidance. Indeed, out, we do. Which you can very merrily put under the nose of your local IT team. And yes. Point them in that direction. So just a quick one. That, coupled with, I was going to say, um, sort of previously successful, for want of a better word, business cases that have been used in similar organisations. IT, you know, IT are ultimately, quite rightly, very defensive. They don't want to be the ones that are told off for doing something terrible and putting the whole whole uh, system at risk. Um, so if they can see it's been done somewhere down the road very similarly, they all of a sudden are a lot more reassured. If it's coupled with national policy as well, it definitely helps. You've already given us a lot of good thoughts on this panel, but anything further to um, add? It used to be the case that security by obscurity uh, was the way you did security. You know, hide your money under your uh, like bed. Uh, that's how we did it. And now we're thinking, actually, when it's out there or not, like it's, if you do it properly, it's safe part, then on your own laptop. Um, but uh, what fascinates me with the security and, and sort of accessibility element of the data, you all probably know Tag Maniacs, right? That amazing thing that the R people in the other room tag. Uh, and you probably heard that it just would be shiny out for Python, which I'm so excited about and I'm just in the process of writing a course about. But is this idea that your data and what the user sees are divided completely by this firewall of the impenetrable sort of access? So you can show what you build, you can show graphs or whatever, but it does, will never see the raw data of your patients or GP practices or whatever. So it's they, like, like, like Andrew. Um, just said people are creating infrastructural wastes. So even if you do something very, very silly by accident, it's still not going to leak your data because there is this sort of very clear division. Uh, and I, I certainly believe that uh, doing it all is the way to go. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the uh, in real life audience and ask if there's any questions for the panel, please. Thanks. Um, so we've talked about the impact of open source on upskilling Python. Um, I'm thinking in terms of building in open source and maintaining. Um, I don't want to say funding, but you know, who are the maintainers? Should it be owned by certain people? And how do we do this? Any thoughts on this? That, that's a, a very interesting question. I think we could go back to what was said in terms of um, you are all so busy and having the support, and I believe the partnership with universities can help a lot. You see, you have, as I said, placement students or undergrad students, postgrad students. We even have now the bootcamp programs, which are quite good. And we have you know, a lot of people coming from so many different backgrounds, learning Python, learning coding, and so on. Um, so this is a good opportunity, again, to interact. Obviously, personally, I believe that the NHS can also have a, a group to work with that. It, you know, the clinical informatician has to be, in my point of view, uh, a 
core job, a core career within the NHS. There is so much universities can help, certainly, but ultimately, I, I, I also believe in that. Um, I, I mentioned stewardship and uh, why now. Uh, it's a real hot button topic in open source right now in general. Um, <coughs> we've got a couple of things really helping us out there. The first one is that this is NHS Digital's program. But it's really, we're going to spend so much time doing maintenance, doing update, doing kind of quality control as things get renewed and updated. Um, so we've got so much great practice to learn from. GDS, pretty much the same, and they've published no end of material on how to do that right. So we've got some really good experience on digital um, in the public domain. In the private domain, we can see a handful of large scale organizations that are really stepping up into that space and having those conversations with us. Uh, so it's, it's a timely question, thank you. Um, but I think we do have the expertise and we do have the infrastructure. Uh, just a quick question. So, you know, I'm maintaining the open source project that I started, so I know how it works. It's literally having a, a, a tree or a bush you know, in your garden. You really need to have trim it and to prune things. So, um, it's important to have a core team of people who maintain and manage some something. Uh, and one nice way to get involved is to help these people, even by finding titles. So, so, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but it was like about who, who should own who should run. The NHS uh, or, or other open source projects. The answer is you um, just find a way to get involved. Uh, I'm not sure if NHS projects do that, but some open source projects I donate to them, literally, so they can figure out what's the best thing to do with their money, even if it's uh, playing coffee. Uh, but yeah, you could, you all, we all uh, maintain these projects, even if it's indirect. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic panel. I've learned so much. I hope other people online learn from this. I want people to watch this later from the recordings. Um, I'm going to say something today um, which I've been shunned for in my trust. Oh, gosh. I love open source. <laughs> now, as a clinician who codes, I get shot down daily for saying that, if I, if I did say it daily. But I have been shot down many times online in my trust and so on. I just want to say that here because I feel that this is the right place to say it. Now. This leads me on to my question, which is, may I point it towards Andrew and break protocol towards Sarah as well? I know you're chairing, but I would love to hear your input on this. I love open source. We should do open source. You've talked about policy. You've talked about waving it in front of you know, senior, dinner, senior digital people in trusts. My worry and something that I see is there's a lack of teeth behind it. And we're putting lots of money into proprietary systems, 360 million pounds towards Palantir, if I may say that in front of all these data scientists here. 170 million pounds for an EPR in St. Thomas's, 12 point, was it what, 12.2 billion pounds for national program for IT, all proprietary systems, you know, no open source, very little that we own. How are we gonna have teeth behind making open source happen in the NHS? Thank you. I feel like I should take that one first. This was all part of the planning. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I think uh, I absolutely do see what you're saying. Just, just, just put that one out there first of all. On the other hand, there's open source and then there's open source, right? Um, we're, if we're talking open source in terms of using R, using Python, using reproducible analytical pipelines, using TREs, using GitHub. I think that's all what I would call um, open source. And the expensive platforms that you, you talk about, um, I'm not going to personally comment on because that is so far above my pay grade. But what I would say is that actually within all of that, that money is being spent, I genuinely believe that within all of that there is actually um, the infrastructure being built to do open source and work openly within that. The, um, as I said in my talk, the move to reproducible analytical pipelines and the, the use of TREs like Open Safely, that absolutely relies on the use of Python, R and GitHub. Um, and the, the, the platform that we've talked about and the ontology behind it actually brings the infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure, the, 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 the data curation 
to, to actually get going with, with some of those things. So yes, the, the stuff itself costs a lot of money, but I would actually like to say that it would, in the end, support the use of, of open, open source. And open source doesn't necessarily mean, mean free. It just means <coughs> open. So yeah, I think actually the two work quite nicely together and can do and should do. Andrew. Yeah, okay. Um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and take on this second part of that question. Um, because although it's above your pay grade, it's very far above my pay grade. Um, nonetheless, uh, within the public domain, the thing that you do that gives things to you is make statements publicly. You, know, you say, this is true, or we're going to do this. And as organizations change, or ministers change, um, those consistent statements are your North Star, the things that allow you to keep on doing work, keep on doing things. Um, I would direct you towards Ace Saves Lives, which is a big strategy which you've got it, clearly know what it is. Um, within that are a series of public commitments related to open, and while other things may change, those statements are in the open and we've publicly committed to you know, accomplishing those things. Um, that process by which we come towards those commitments and we enact them is ongoing. We're engaged in it, we will continue to be engaged in it through this year, next year, hopefully the year beyond. Um, yeah, look at them, they're pretty toothsome, I think is maybe the right word. Um, they've got some potential in them. Uh, we're working on applying to them as fully as we can. Yeah. And a policy, as you say, is only as good as it, as it gets used. It, it's that ultimate kind of, can be used, I think, as a, as a bit of a catalyst. It can just, you know, sit on a shelf and go, that's lovely. Or depending on who gets hold of it, um, it can be that little kickstart to get, get going. And this is a personal opinion now, but I, I think there's something to be said a little bit like the, the badge that I, I put up if you want to do something to exist maybe just make it exist and once that thing exists and it's doing good and it's helping it's really hard to put it back in the box yeah i also think that it's all about the communities and it because open source is community so if everyone's working together building strong solutions that's the power of open source if you go to linux as, as an operating system you know it's one of the safest operating systems or some of the safest operating systems are Linux based, so they are open source based. So you can make it very secure, very reliable, strong, fast as a community. And if I go back to your presentation, uh, Sarah, as well, um, if you want something, you build it. So, you know, as a community, good examples, good case studies, things that work well have the potential to change the world. So, ticking the box again, you've built the enterprise now. Five years to boldly go where no one has ever gone. Uh, I'm just going to plug off the rocket again because I can. Um, within the, hopefully the next couple of weeks, if not the next couple of months, we've got an open source playbook coming out. Uh, you folks might be familiar with digital playbooks thus far. Generally speaking, they've got about 12, a dozen or so examples of them. We've got 16, and there were lots that we couldn't include because they're just starting up now. Those examples of really innovative, really great open source work are there, we're promoting them, we're trying to kind of convince people that this can be done, that it's being done, that it has been done. Once you've shown a thing can be done and it's done well, it's hard to put it back in the box. Indeed it is. And that is actually us at time. So um, I want to thank all of my panel members today. Any final sentences to wrap this up? Pavel, I'll come to you first. Right. Uh, I'll use my final sentence to answer the previous question. But it's the medium which is real to say. You know how we try to write a donkey and have a carrot and a stick to only get your organization to use open source or use my group one? But one thing you also need to write a donkey is the road and the road signs. So finding the environment of people who help you. Like I put into my stuff if not for the support of the main library of the university and the, the amazing people in it. So it's not just carrot and stick, it's the finding environment in which you can write that donkey and you know where to go. That's, that's, that's my message. Community. Yeah. Absolutely. A lovely way to end that. Um, any final words from Tiago? Yeah, no, I, I think that's it. So we're here, so the uni universities around the UK are here to help. I'm sure um, all of them would be more than happy to interact on education level, research level, building projects, building products, and again, going back to what Andrew said, 
Um, the moment you can show that something is safe and secure, works, then you have a good um, case study to go forward, and, and that's, that's a good um, thing to go. Um, uh, one thing that came to my mind, which is getting started, uh, um, and, and you talked about the security and installing things, uh, another open um, and web-based platform that you can use is called Replit. I don't know if anyone has used Replit. Uh, you don't really need to install it. Jupyter, as well, has some online thing. Uh, to work with, so uh, we're here to help. By all means, just get in touch, and it'll be a pleasure to help. Wonderful, thank you. And a final few words, from Andrew. Going to bring it back around to the top. Now is the time. It really is. Wonderful stuff. Thank you very much again to my panelists for taking part, and thank you for your questions.